What's the verdict? Has the 20 trillion package been good for India or not? The answer, unfortunately, is mired in politics and not facts. But really, what is the verdict? This is a special series of Money with Monica, in which I'm decoding policy and events around the corona crisis as they happen. I'm also taking your questions. On May 12th, Prime Minister Narendra Modi made some big announcements. India, he said, is ready to spend 10% of its GDP, or 20 trillion rupees, that's 20 with 12 zeros behind it, to fight the corona pandemic. He also said that India is ready for some big reforms across the four L's of land, labor, laws and liquidity. Starting May 13th, and for the next five days, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman itemized out where the money was going to be spent, how much, and who the beneficiaries are. Almost immediately, the quibbles began on whether this 10% of GDP was really much lower and that the Indian budget was going to be spending a tiny part of this money and the rest was really going to come from liquidity enhancement measures. We need to look at some numbers to see the truth of this argument. India's spend from the budget is going to be about 2 trillion rupees or under 2% of the GDP, which goes straight into the beneficiaries in this COVID relief package. The rest of the money is coming from liquidity enhancement measures, from credit support, from credit guarantees, through the government institutions, through the central banks, to largely micro, small enterprises, a host of beneficiaries who need the working capital, who need credit to keep their enterprises alive. India is choosing to go down the credit enhancement route rather, rather than the dole route. Now let's ask the question that, okay, so we're spending 2 trillion, but where is it going? 60% of this 2 trillion is going to the poorest of the poor through cash transfers, a lot of which has already happened, and through the Manrega, which uh, promises to provide 100 days of work through the year for a minimum wage. One of the criticisms is that India is not doing enough to spend its way out of this crisis. Look at the US, look at some EU countries, look at Japan, they say. They're spending 10 to 20% of their GDP through their budgets to spend their way out of this crisis. There are countries picking up the private sector wage bill. 80% of the salaries of private sector employees are coming from the government directly into the accounts of people. These are countries printing their way out of trouble. Now, the argument seem to miss a key fact that India may be in the top 10 countries in terms of GDP, but in terms of per capita income, we are way below. We're at $2,000 per capita income. That part of GDP attributable to each person is per capita income. Countries we are comparing ourselves with are between forty dollars to $60,000. This means a lot of difference in terms of the resilience of the country and the wealth that it has in terms of dealing with this problem. Second, Indian rupee is not reserve currency, which means that people don't buy rupee to, uh, as a store of value as they buy the dollar or the euro. If India starts to print too much money, it's going to cause hyperinflation. And this is firepower that India needs to preserve for the future. This crisis is far from over. And to use this uh, uh, major weapon of printing more currency, to be used at the front end of the problem rather than keeping your powder dry for later is probably going to be counterproductive. The other number that we need to really worry about is the deficit. Already, given the 2 trillion rupees spent, we're already looking at a 10 to 12 percent deficit, which is excess of government spend over revenue for the financial year between the states and the center. Now, the problem of large deficits is that it causes instability of the economy. We are still an emerging economy. We need foreign flows coming in. We need foreign investment. And uh, when you have very large deficit, it causes instability to the economy. So the government, in a way, is being prudent to say that we keep our powder dry. We will try and fund those who need it. And who needs the money? Remember, we have 300 million poor people in the country. They need food. They need basics to survive. We are trying to compare this situation with populations who have very different standards of living. 
So correctly, the money which has been spent has gone to those who really need it. And remember, there's another crucial difference. The Indian household saving rate is about 17%. And we know that the average American household is very badly over leveraged. So even in terms of the resilience of middle India, there is months of savings in store which can be used at the moment. So the need to directly fund the average salaried employee today, neither do we have the money, nor is there need right now to do that. So in a way, what the government has done is very prudent. But there is one quibble, which is that the announcements on the reforms sounded very big when Prime Minister Modi made them. We were all geared up for a 1991 kind of a moment with big reform announcements. That has clearly not happened. We've had reform announcements on agriculture, which have been good. But other than that, it has been more response than reform. There is masses of regulatory cholesterol. There is masses of red tape. The business ease of doing business is still a joke. We need to deal with this. This is that COVID moment where we are saying that India over China is not going to, it's not going to happen without some big bank reform. I'm hoping that in the days ahead, in the months ahead, we do get those announcements because this really is that time. But as far as the announcements go, this has been a big disappointment. This crisis is actually far from over and you must keep watching as I decode things as they happen around the corona crisis. And do keep writing in to me at moneywithmonica at livemin.com. Till the next time, stay healthy and stay wealthy.